Do you know the difference between eternal life, everlasting life, and Eonian life? In this video, we're going to see how two of the most gracious laws God gave to Moses shed eye-opening light on God's great plan to save us all from sin and death and set us all free. You won't hear this in church. God is at peace with the world. He is at peace with you. How can this be? Jesus died for your sins. Jesus was entombed. Jesus was roused the third day. Hebrews 10.1 For the law having a shadow of the impending good things, not the selfsame image of the matters. The law God gave to Moses foreshadowed the good things to come. And we see just before this in Hebrews 9.11, Now Christ coming along a chief priest of the impending good things. The good things to come that were foreshadowed by the law will be accomplished by God through Christ. In Leviticus 25, the law God gave to Moses teaches us about the law of redemption and the law of jubilee for the nation of Israel. The laws of redemption and jubilee are shadows of the impending good things regarding God's plan to save us all through His Son. In the law, God set up Israel to operate economically in 50-year cycles, and some of the economic laws were given in consideration of the poor in Israel. When Israel came into the land God gave them, each tribe and family was given an allotment of land to use as their own. God told Israel in Leviticus 25.3, Six years shall you sow your field, and six years shall you prune your vineyard, and you will gather its yield. In verse 4 he said, Yet in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of cessation for the land, a Sabbath to Yahweh. Your field you shall not sow, and your vineyard you shall not prune. God, who is the true owner of all the land, told Israel to let the land rest one out of every seven years. This seven-year cycle was to be repeated seven times. The end of the seven cycles of seven years would take Israel through 49 years of the 50-year cycle. Then, on the tenth day of the fiftieth year, which was the Day of Atonement, a.k.a. Yom Kippur, a high holy day in Israel, the trumpet blast was to be sounded over all the land of Israel. And in verse 10 of Leviticus 25, God says, And you will hollow the year, the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty in the land to all its dwellers. A jubilee year shall this one be for you. Each of you will return to his holding, and each of you shall return to his family. I love the end of that verse. Each of you shall return to his family. This reveals the heart of our Heavenly Father. They would return to their holding and their family because, prior to the Jubilee, some in Israel would become poor and have to sell the use of their own land holding. Or one might become poor and have to sell himself to an owner, thus having to leave his family to work for his new owner. The land use and the person could only be sold up to the next 50th year Jubilee. For example, if a landowner fell on hard times and had to sell his land use or himself 40 years before the next Jubilee, he would have to wait until the Jubilee, then he would get his land use back free and clear, or he would go free from his owner. This is the law of the Jubilee. That's great, but 40 years is a long time to wait. So God provided another way the poor person could get his land back or go free from his owner. If the man had to sell his land use or himself 40 years before the next Jubilee, he could get it back early or go free early without having to wait for the Jubilee release if he had a kinsman redeemer who had the means to buy it back for him. The ability to buy the land back early or to be released from an owner early is the law of redemption. God established the merciful laws of redemption in Jubilee to work together to ensure freedom for all, even though all could experience freedom at various times during the 50-year cycle. Redemption was not the only way to freedom in Israel. Those who weren't redeemed early would go out free in the Jubilee year. Verse 54, If he is not being redeemed in any of these ways, then he will go forth in the year of the Jubilee, he and his sons with him. Notice, he and his sons would go free and return to his family in the Jubilee year. The restoration of families was a primary component of the laws of redemption and Jubilee. This reveals the heart of our God and our Father. So how do the gracious laws of redemption and Jubilee in Israel foreshadow God's good plan to save all mankind? Here's where we begin to see the distinctions between eternal life, everlasting life, and Ionian life. Let's look at these first by examining one of the most popular verses in the scriptures. 
John 3.16 in the NIV, the KJV, and the Concordant Literal New Testament. NIV. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. From the KJV. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Concordant Literal New Testament. For thus God loves the world, so that he gives his only begotten Son, that everyone who is believing in him should not be perishing, but may be having life eonian. Each of these three translations is talking about a very different span of life. Eternal life, everlasting life, and life eonian are not the same. Trying to force them to mean the same thing leads to tremendous misunderstanding of God and his plan to save all through Jesus. The word translated as eternal, everlasting, and eonian is the Greek adjective ionion. The word ionion comes from the Greek noun ion, which is the longest segment of time known in the scriptures. An ion has a beginning and an end. Ion is used in the plural form in over half of its occurrences, revealing that ion is not equivalent with eternity, which has no beginning or end. Because an ion has a beginning and an end, Ionian things begin and end, and occur during the times Ionian, which consists of five ions. Many things are described by the word Ionian in the Greek scriptures. Life, glory, salvation, redemption, God, judgment, chastisement, fire, dwellings, etc. Because eternity has no beginning or end, eternal life is life that has no beginning or end. Therefore, only those who have no beginning or end can have eternal life. And there is only one who has no beginning or end. He is the only true God, who is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one who has no beginning or end. No one who believes in Jesus, and not even Jesus himself, can have eternal life because we all had a beginning. So eternal is a bad translation of the Greek word ionian. Jesus is not talking about eternal life in John 3.16. Because an ion has a beginning and an end, and so do Ionian things, everlasting is also a bad translation of Ionian, because everlasting things have no end. Therefore, Jesus is not talking about everlasting life in John 3.16. The concordant version translates Ionian well with the English word Ionian. Ionian life for the believer is the special life they have during the times Ionian. This is the life Jesus is talking about in John 3.16. It has a beginning and an end. Because the times Ionian will conclude at some point, the believer's Ionian life will also conclude. Some who have heard this have asked me, so are you saying the believer's life is going to end and he'll die at the conclusion of the eons? Yes. I'm kidding. No, believers with the Ionian life, the elect, will not die at the conclusion of the eons. They will be made immortal and incorruptible by God at the beginning of the fourth eon. And they will continue to be immortal and incorruptible through eons four and five, and after the times Ionian have reached their glorious consummation. In essence, at the consummation of the eons, the believer who had Ionian life transitions from Ionian life to everlasting life. But what about those who don't believe in this life? Those who don't have and enjoy Ionian life? They will be made immortal and incorruptible at the consummation of the times Ionian. All people, because of Christ's death and resurrection, will have everlasting life. But not all people will have Ionian life. Ionian life is given to the elect. They will enter their life and freedom in Christ early, before the rest. This is how the laws of redemption and jubilee foreshadow the truth of the salvation of all. In our comparison, redemption foreshadows the Ionian life of the believer. It is early enjoyment of freedom. Ionian life is the early enjoyment by the elect of the salvation that Jesus secured for all 2,000 years ago. The freedom for the rest at the Jubilee foreshadows the non-elect being freed from death at the consummation of the eons. Because all will have immortality and incorruptibility and everlasting life at the consummation of the eons, that is not the life Jesus is talking about in John 3.16. 
The life he is talking about there is Eonian life, the early blessing of life for those who believe in him during this life. As Leviticus 25, 54 says, If he is not being redeemed in any of these ways, then he will go forth in the year of the Jubilee, he and his sons with him. This foreshadows the freedom for all at the consummation of the eons. 1 Corinthians 15 reveals to us that the vivification of all mankind occurs in different classes at different times. Yet now Christ has been roused from among the dead, the first fruit of those who are reposing. For since, in fact, through a man came death, through a man also comes the resurrection of the dead. For even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. Yet each in his own class, the first fruit Christ, thereupon those who are Christ's in his presence, thereafter the consummation, whenever he may be giving up the kingdom to his God and Father, whenever he should be nullifying all sovereignty and all authority and power. For he must be reigning until he should be placing all all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy is being abolished, death, for he subjects all under his feet. Now, whenever he may be saying that all is subject, it is evident that it is outside of him who subjects all to him. Now, whenever all may be subjected to him, then the Son himself also shall be subjected to him who subjects all to him, that God may be all in all. Verse 22 makes it clear to those given eyes to see that even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. Because of Christ, all will be vivified, meaning made immortal and incorruptible, just like Christ, the first fruit. This will occur in classes at different times. The remaining two classes after Christ are, first, those who are Christ. This is the elect, those who believe in this life, and this will occur in his presence, at the end of this present wicked eon. They will have eonian life for the oncoming eons, eons four and five. They experience redemption long before the rest are free. This is a great blessing for the elect. God can grant the elect this great early blessing without having to condemn the rest to eternal torment or everlasting death. The final class to be vivified, foreshadowed by those set free at the Jubilee, will be made immortal and incorruptible at the consummation, verse 24. This is the consummation of the times Eonian, when many of the great events listed here will occur. Verse 24, Christ gives up the kingdom to his God and Father after after his successful reign comes to an end when he completes all his father's work in the times Eonian. Also in verse 24, the nullifying of all sovereignty and all authority and power. There will be no more need for anyone to rule and reign over anyone else when the kingdom is completed. Verse 25, all enemies will be placed under his feet. Verse 26, the last enemy is being abolished, death. This last enemy is the second death, which is the lake of fire, not the first death. When the second death is rendered inoperative, it will no longer hold any of mankind who have been dead and held in it during the fifth eon. Those who were dead in the second death will be made immortal and incorruptible. The third and final class to be vivified, leaving none dead forever. Then the salvation Jesus secured for all 2,000 years ago will be realized and experienced by all in its fullness. Verse 27, all who are under Christ's feet will be subjected, with his Father being the only exception to this complete subjection. Verse 28, then the Father subjects his Son, and God will be all in all. This is foreshadowed in the law of the Jubilee, Leviticus 25, 41. Then he will go forth with you, he and his sons with him, and return to his family. And God, as Father of all, will have all of his family forever. All mankind has been saved by the Savior of the world and will be free in God's great jubilee at the consummation of the eons, when God will be all in all. The reconciliation of all creation has been secured by the blood of Christ's cross. If your view of God has him punishing people forever, or being dead forever instead of being set free forever, then your view of God contradicts the shadow of the jubilee. So God has the salvation of all covered, whether it's Jesus the man who is the ransom for all, or whether he is the redeemer of the elect as the kinsman redeemer, or God's declaration that all will go free in the jubilee, no one will fall through the cracks. In fact, with God, there are no cracks. That there are cracks in God's plan is only a bad rumor propagated by the millions in orthodox Christianity who know only false distortions of God's plans, power, and love. 
Thanks for watching. I recommend this video to you next.